Okay. There we go. Just making sure that's being recorded. I think that should be good. Okay, uh, I'll wait two more minutes just for people to funnel in, but we got everything good to go on the back end. All right, I've been given the green light. Um, both ready to go? Give me a little thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Looking forward to the talk, guys. All right, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Invasive Species Center webinar series. Uh, my apologies if you were booted from a previous attempt at recording this. Uh, we had some technical difficulties and we started through those logistics. And from what I expect, it should be smooth sailing from now on. Um, just a reminder that uh, this webinar will be recorded and available on our YouTube page to be able to access it in case you can't attend for the full uh, one hour session that we are still planning on having uh, starting today at 1130 Eastern Standard Time and ending at roughly 1230 Eastern Standard Time. Um, so just a little bit of background and context, starting from the top about this series and about Invasive Species Center as an organization. Um, so. Uh, we're an organization that tries to connect stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to try and prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that might pose harm to Canada's environment, economy, and society. Um, my role with the Invasive Species Center is as a research and strategy coordinator, and I'm going to be the moderator for today. Uh, just a little bit of um, uh, uh, to do a territorial acknowledgement. Um, I just want to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nations people on the lands known as Canada, and we strive to show respect to their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. We greatly appreciate the significance of the lands, waters, and all living things and offer our gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for their care for and teaching about our Earth. Our relationship with Indigenous com communities are important, and we're going to continue to listen and learn how we can be in uh, good relationships with Indigenous peoples, the land and waters, and all living things, and act accordingly. The Invasive Species Center respectfully acknowledges that our head office is located on the traditional lands in the Anishinaabek, the Batchwana and Garden River First Nation, as well as the long-time settlement of the Métis people in the Robinson-Huron Robinson Treaty area. So we've got a lot of great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and more. So feel free to check us out at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. You can also sign up on our homepage uh, for a number of uh, newsletters. So we have the uh, the spread, which is a quarterly newsletter, and we have a biweekly media scan of research and uh, media that's out there, as well as event invitations for things such as this webinar series and our invasive species forum that will be hosted next month. We've also launched a new invasive species training program that offers virtual courses on topics related to invasive species. We currently have two courses available which focus on different forest invasives, but we're releasing new content regularly. So feel free to stay tuned um, through our newsletters and online engagement. Okay. 
So before we get started today, um, there's a couple of things just worth mentioning. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have any, feel free to please type it in the question box and I'll read it out for the presenters after the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties at any time, uh, please type them in the chat box or respond to the email found in your registration and we'll try our best to resolve it for you. We've also enabled closed captioning. So if you would like to follow along that way, you can turn um, those on with the closed captions button on your taskbar. And lastly, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar. If you could take a little bit of time to just fill it out, it's just five or six questions to my understanding, um, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, so today's webinar is titled uh, Little Program, Big Responsibility, a behind the scenes look at how Saskatchewan manages a provincial watercraft inspection program to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers, uh, Jerry Geiger and Paige Kalapi from the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment. Uh, so Jerry has been an aquatic invasive species team lead with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment since 2018. She has a BSc in environmental biology and prior to joining the um, aquatic invasive species program. She worked as a conservation officer for 14 years. In 2015, Jerry was part of a group of five officers from the ministry that traveled to Minnesota and received watercraft inspection training. This training led to the initial creation and development of the watercraft inspection program in Saskatchewan. Paige has been the aquatic invasive species ecologist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment since uh, 2021 when the position was created. She has an undergraduate uh, degree in environmental science and completed a master's program in sustainable environmental management. Before her current role, she spent time working as a student and technician with many different groups, including various freshwater field programs and in aquatic lab laboratories. The Aquatic Invasive Species Program resides in the Fish, Wildlife and Lands branch within the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment and is made up solely of Jerry and Paige's positions. Uh, my thanks to the two of them for attending. I'm very much looking forward to the talk. And with that, I'm happy to hand it over to the two of you as far as your slides and presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Michael, for the introduction. I will share my screen instead now. Okay, we looking, everything's looking good? Looks good to awesome. me. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Michael, so much for the introduction and all the support preparing for this webinar. Uh, Jerry and I are feeling really excited that we were given the opportunity to talk about our program. So we're glad to be able to share that with you all here today. So thanks everyone for joining. It's not every day that Saskatchewan makes headlines. Like Michael said, my name is Paige Colaby, and I am the aquatic invasive species ecologist for the Ministry of Environment here in Saskatchewan. And like he said, my position was actually just created in July of 2021. So Jerry and I together make up the AIS program in Saskatchewan. And before me, it was just Jerry, who was absolutely fundamental in building this whole program. Um, so I'm really, anything that I say is really just going to be sharing Jerry Slender because she's the one that put her blood, sweat and tears into this before me. Um, but so we went from a one woman team to a two woman team. And that's kind of how we got the idea for the name of our presentation, little program, big responsibility. So little because we're little with our staffing and the size of our resources, things like that. And big because we manage many different components of the aquatic invasive species program. So we cover everything from watercraft inspection to uh, monitoring of species, education, outreach, legislation, um, and the actual management of those species. But today we're just going to get into the nitty gritty of one component of our aquatic invasive species program. And that is our watercraft inspection program. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a good understanding of how our program operates here in Saskatchewan and what goes into one inspection season. Okay, aquatic invasive species, um, permission to use the acronym AIS for the rest of the webinar gets to be a, a big mouthful. So. I think most people joining today likely already have some familiar with AIS. Um, so I'll just briefly go over what they are, 
um, some of the impacts and main pathways of spread that we're mostly focused on here in Saskatchewan. Um, but first and foremost, AAS can be fish, invertebrates, aquatic plants, or diseases that are spread or introduced to a new area where they are not native to and have a negative impact to the environment, economy, or society. And so some non-native species that are spread to a new area actually do so without any negative impacts. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. But so an invasive species is that combination of being non-native and having that negative impact. And I've included a couple photos of some of the main AIS that um, you know, we're concerned about here in Saskatchewan. So first on the left, <clears throat> this is a Prussian carp, which is an invasive fish that we have in Saskatchewan. It was introduced into Alberta and has since spread to Saskatchewan through connected water bodies. Um, next, of course, the zebra mussel, which are pretty popular in the AIS world. They receive a ton of attention and for good reason too, because their impacts, the impacts from these species are really endless and they have successfully invaded so many different jurisdictions in North America. Uh, currently in Saskatchewan, we are fortunate to be free of invasive mussels, zebra and quagga mussels, um, as is the rest of Canada, uh, Western Canada, sorry, as well. And lastly, we have flowering rush here. So this is a highly invasive aquatic plant and is also a species that we are actively controlling in Saskatchewan. And of course, as I mentioned, there's tons of uh, aquatic diseases that are also considered invasive as well. So this is just trying to show you the diversity of types of species um, of aquatic invasive species. And you can imagine different species have different impacts and different pathways of spread as well. And talking about impacts, I mentioned that in aquatic invasive species have will always have a negative impact to the environment, economy, or society. And most of the time, it's actually to all three here. So I'll just give you a couple examples of each type. So first, impacts to the environment. AIS can outcompete native species and species at risk, and they can do so by um, feeding on the food that native species uh, feed on as well or by utilizing their habitat, or just by directly preying on them as well. They can change or decrease water quality and alter habitat that those native species live in. Uh, to the economy, so a lot of the talk about impacts from AIS to the economy are mostly associated with costs. So huge costs to control species once they are introduced, or a loss of money um, from uh, things like declining tourism. So um, if there was an invasive species to be introduced, there might be um, a decline in tourism in, in that water body. And of course, damage to infrastructure as well. So things like hydropower facilities and water treatment plants. And lastly, we have impacts to society. And so the main thing uh, that I think about with this are just loss of recreational opportunities. Um, and things like decreasing property values um, with, say, the introduction of an invasive species or degrading the quality of, of beaches. And just a couple more examples here. I mentioned that most of the time an AIS will impact all three of those um, different uh, environment, economy, and society. So first, we have a photo of invasive zebra mussels here on the left. And so um, invasive zebra mussels are really efficient filter feeders, which I'm sure many of you may know, and they can significantly reduce zooplankton populations, um, which reduces the amount of food available for native species that feed on zooplankton. So there's an environmental impact. Um, as you can see in the picture here, they've completely taken over this uh, water intake system. So there's your economic impact with the cost associated with fixing this equipment or retrofitting or just the cost of removing these muscles. And oops, sorry, finally to society, um, when zebra mussels die, their shells can actually um, wash up on beaches and just completely take over beaches like sand. But the shells 
can be razor sharp. So it definitely um, reduces the amount of traffic at some of those lakes. And this is actually happening at Lake Winnipeg on some shores. And on the right here, we have a picture of a lake in Wisconsin that has unfortunately had introductions of a couple of different highly invasive aquatic plants, um, Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf bondweed. And so same thing, uh, environmental impact would be just an example of the amount of weeds that have taken over this area, just totally push out all the native plants and create a monoculture of habitat that isn't really desirable to a lot of species. So, um, and then economically impact, um, just the costs associated with manually removing these plants. And of course, a good, this is a good example of an impact to society where this beach area isn't really usable anymore with the heavy, heavy growth of weeds here. And before I move on to pathways of spread, I just wanted to quickly touch base about aquatic invasive species and aquatic species at risk. So AIS and ASAR, so many acronyms, I know. <laughs> Um, but aquatic invasive species have actually been identified as one of the main threats to aquatic species at risk. And the Canadian Nature Fund for Aquatic Species at Risk, another <laughs> acronym, supports aquatic species at risk by funding different projects um, aimed to protect them. And one of those areas is specifically invasive species management. And you can see uh, on the green shaded portion of this map here. Um, this is the Southern Priorities Area for Aquatic Species at Risk. And you can see that most of it is actually in Southern Saskatchewan here. And so I just wanted to highlight that we have been fortunate enough to receive some funding from this project, uh, which has actually allowed us to keep some of our watercraft inspection stations uh, open for longer hours and do some targeted research to try and prevent um, invasive species into this area. Okay, and now, so now that we've covered what AIS are and what kind of impacts they have, let's talk about how they spread. So first and foremost, we have the movement of recreational and commercial watercraft. So there are so many species, aquatic invasive species that spread through this pathway. And that is because um, they like to hitchhike on this type of equipment so they can actually attach themselves to boats and gear. And this includes all different life stages of invasive species. So just um, sticking with the zebra mussel example, adult zebra mussels can attach themselves physically to boats and gear, as well as the villager life stage of zebra mussels um, can actually just be transported in water as well. Pet and aquarium trade. So once again, there are many, many species that are um, in, have interest as pets, such as goldfish or ornamental plants that can become highly invasive when they're released into the wild. Ballast water discharge. Um, if you've been following along with zebra mussels, you'll know that this is um, the likely cause of zebra mussels being introduced into North America. And so large ships often have um, ballast water systems that allow them to take on huge quantities of water for stability. And then they discharge that water after they've unloaded cargo somewhere else. So they're picking up water in one location and discharging it at another, which is how they're um, you know, spreading species through that water actually. And many wakeboard boats and surf boats, so some of those new fancy boats will actually have some small ballast water systems in them to take on water to make a bigger wake. So there's another um, example of that. Live bait. So there are actually quite a few invasive fish species that when they are young or at that juvenile stage, they can be mistaken for native species. And so this is one way that they can be spread um, if anglers are dumping live bait. Live food, so same kind of thing, that release of live, of live fish or invertebrates again, but this would be with um, live seafood that can be purchased at markets. And 
some there are some people who follow traditions or think maybe it's the right thing to do to release the crab at the seafood market but if they do if they do survive that release they can have negative impacts as well and become invasive and so like i talked about the pathway that we're going to focus on today since we're talking about our watercraft inspection program is the movement of re recreational and commercial watercrafts and so you've maybe seen some of the photos um, like this that I've shared here on the screen. We have a prop that is absolutely covered in zebra mussels. Um, this trailer here for a watercraft that has a ton of aquatic plane plants uh, hanging off from it. And uh, on the top right here is invasive spiny water flea attached to angling line. So like I've said before, um, many, many different species move through this um, pathway, um, many different life forms and um, species that aren't connected by uh, watersheds can, can be um, intentionally spread or in unintentionally spread through this pathway. So water bodies that weren't connected are now connected through boats um, being moved from place to place. And so I have a question here now, and I think Michael is going to bring up a poll for everybody, but I'm just interested to see who on this call may have traveled to another province or state with a boat, either whether it was like your boat physically or like a family or friends, friends boat, and if you have ever taken that boat to another province or state. And when I say boat, um, I'm including many different types of boats, all the different types. So not just motor boats, but also canoes, kayaks, um, sailboats, paddle boards, jet skis. So if you can just quickly answer that question just for um, my interest. And Michael, if you just want to let me know um, when that's finished, that we can move on, or if you need to share the results. Sure thing, Paige. Uh, we'll just wait another few seconds here to get some responses in because they are slowing down. Sounds good. All right, I'm going to end it here. Uh, my hope is that everyone can see the results. All right, cool. Awesome. Well, it looks like there are some people on the call who have, um, which is interesting. It's just, um, yeah, for my curiosity's sake. Um, but so when I was about 10 years old, my family actually took our boat to go visit some of my cousins in Ontario. And so um, here we are down in Southeast Saskatchewan. Here's my family taking our boat. And we went to Thunder Lake, Ontario, actually, to go visit some cousins. And we were there for about a week. Um, we boated around that water body. And I went tubing and water skiing and did all the things. And then we came home. And I'm sure the days or weeks following after we got home, we were visiting some of our favorite local lakes as well. So um, here's an example of a recreational watercraft being moved. So on this scale, one boat going and coming back, not such a big deal. But if we look at this on a bigger time scale, say through one summer season, we have people moving all kinds of boats to all kinds of different locations, traveling hundreds and sometimes thousands of kilometers, um, visiting numerous lakes each summer. So we've got, like I said, kayaks, canoes, motorboats, sailboats, um, even semi trucks with four or five, six boats loaded up on a trailer going across the country. And so suddenly we have a lot of traffic and a lot of different watercraft movements that risk spreading aquatic invasive species through um, water, mud, plants, seeds, diseases, um, and the species are attaching themselves to the boats or this equipment. And so looking at this same map of Canada here and uh, Northern United States, 
let's also look at the distribution of some of the main aquatic invasive species of concern, at least from our perspective and those that are notorious for this um, pathway of pitching onto boats and gear. And so once again, here we are, Saskatchewan, little old Saskatchewan. And like I mentioned, we are currently free of um, invasive sea from mussels. And although we do have a couple of AIS that we are managing in the province, we are fortunate to be free of some of those um, really nasty ones. So first let's look at zebra mussels. So I've just kind of, I'm just trying to show um, a very general um, overview of where they're located in North America here. Um, next, we have Eurasian water milfoil. So this is a invasive aquatic plant that I've talked about. Another one that's um, really easily picked up from trailers and motors, um, from boats going in and out of boat launch. We have spiny water flea. So that was the one I showed you that was the essentially blob located on the fishing line. So this one's also very easily transported through that type of gear within boats. Um, New Zealand mud snail, so another one that's common for hitchhiking onto boats. And I have this little icon here for diseases. So this one that I'm talking about specifically would be um, whirling disease. So um, as you can see, we're kind of surrounded here in Saskatchewan by a lot of these species. And so when we mix the distribution of these aquatic invasive species that like to hitchhike on boats with the crazy amounts of watercraft traffic that we see in a year, what do we get? Well, unfortunately, we get, we get this sometimes. But it's not all sad um, that now that we know that which species like to hitchhike and we know how watercraft move, it kind of presents us an opportunity to manage this pathway. And I'll uh, pass it over to Jerry to talk more about that. Sure, thanks Paige. So as Paige mentioned, um, humans are the primary um, cause of spread of aquatic invasive species. And particularly for this pathway, you know, when it comes to managing uh, the pathway and the movement of recreational and commercial watercraft, uh, we do that through watercraft inspection. That is our primary means of prevention for that particular pathway. So we will get into a bit more of the detail on our watercraft inspection programs here. So here in Saskatchewan um, and across Western Canada, uh, many of us operate similar watercraft inspection programs, obviously on different scales and with, with a few different unique um, qualities, but there's a ton of coordination that takes place between um, these particular jurisdictions and there are watercraft inspection stations um, operating in almost all of the or, or several um, U.S. states as well. And, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of communication between um, Western provinces and Canadian jurisdictions, but also with um, U.S. jurisdictions as well. So here in Saskatchewan, we are a risk-based program science-backed program, um, and we're attempting to prevent the spread into Saskatchewan and further into Western Canada. And so what I mean by this is that we are making risk-based decisions uh, through our data collection, um, through a watercraft inspection program, which allows us to, uh, to be efficient with the use of our resources and um, make sure that we're targeting those high-risk routes of entry. We are a rural province with several roads and access points, which makes it very, very challenging when you're a small program. So we really use those risk -based, uh, that risk-based model to prioritize resources and uh, points of entry and so on. So our primary goal, obviously, is to prevent the spread of AIS through inspection and decontamination of recreational and commercial watercraft. So really just assessing the risk. But what we also want to do is build really good behaviors. We want to change behaviors and make sure that people understand best management practices and make that part of their daily routine when they're using their watercraft. Um, that's really the most effective prevention method is to, to have those boaters following clean, drain, dry and best management practices. Um, and that would be the most effective way to prevent the spread. Um, we also, you know, have a, a regulatory piece. So we have compliance staff that are enforcing our regulations. Here in Saskatchewan, everything related to aquatic invasive species is found under the, uh, the Fisheries Act Saskatchewan 2020 and its regulations, the fisheries regulations. And currently we're undergoing modernization of the regulations. Um, you can see the act was, was completed in 2020 with some new additions 
And we're currently working on modernization of the fisheries regulations, which will include, you know, several updated definitions, um, some additional measures to strengthen our prevention efforts, um, new species listed to uh, or added to our prohibited species list, etc. So um, excited for that to uh, to come into effect and, uh, and just increase our, our regulatory tools. Um, there are other pieces of legislation that we have um, that help um, mitigate the, the movement and risk of aquatic invasive species. So we have the federal piece, the federal AIS regulations, which is a, a, a piece that is um, mandated to Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Canada Border Services Agency also provides support um, in enforcing those regulations. And then in Saskatchewan here, our aquatic invasive weeds are actually listed under the Weed Control Act, which is uh, sort of owned or, or mandated by uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. And part of our modernization is likely that we will also adopt those aquatic um, invasive plants into our fisheries regulations as well. So. So here in Saskatchewan, it is illegal to possess, transport, import, um, or release a prohibited species. And all of our prohibited species are found under table 10 of our fisheries regulations. Um, page up on the screen has the current list, but we will likely be um, adding species to that list as well. So the last, uh, these came into effect, I believe in 2015. So they are ready for some updates. And one of the main uh, regulations that we use, I guess, to prevent um, spread and really make any early detection efforts feasible here in Saskatchewan is that mandated requirement to remove the drain plug anytime somebody is transporting a watercraft in our province. And really that's just to help uh, facilitate the draining of the watercraft and to prevent movement from one water body to another. And as Paige mentioned, you know, we're fortunate to, we have not detected um, zebra or quagga mussels here in Saskatchewan to date. Um, however, you know, there are watercraft moving from multiple water bodies in very short periods of time here in Saskatchewan. And, and we want to make sure that if something is picked up in our monitoring that we haven't had watercraft moving from multiple water bodies um, during that time before it was picked it up in our monitoring efforts. So this piece of regulation um, or this, this requirement, while very simple, is a really important piece when it comes to um, preventing and containing spread, particularly for uh, zebra quagga mussels. And um, like the other Western provinces, uh, it is mandatory to stop at all active inspection stations when transporting watercraft. So uh, this includes unmotorized and motorized watercraft. This includes our commercial haulers that are transporting boats, whether they're brand new or they're used, does not matter. If you are transporting a watercraft of any type, um, it is mandatory to stop at all of those active stations you encounter on your way. And as part of the coordinated efforts for uh, the other uh, provinces within Western Canada, um, just because you stop and are inspected at one in one jurisdiction at one watercraft inspection station, it is still mandatory to, to stop at all inspection stations that you encounter along your way. Um, for those that are familiar or work with the IS, you know how small and difficult they can be to identify and to detect. And so those multiple inspections are really just to, to provide additional layers of protection along the way for the uh, moving watercraft. Um, here in Saskatchewan, we also don't allow the use of live bait. And uh, recently in 2020, this was, uh, there were additional prohibitions related to crayfish and the collection of crayfish in Saskatchewan really to prevent um, the introduction and spread of invasive crayfish, but also um, further movement of native crayfish into watersheds where they don't cur currently exist here in Saskatchewan. So we do not allow any live bait here in Saskatchewan. And when it comes to enforcement, um, so we have our own watercraft inspectors here within our program that are dedicated for that purpose for watercraft inspection and decontamination. Um, but we also work really closely with um, the conservation officers who have recently moved over to a new ministry of corrections, policing and public safety. So we all used to be within the Ministry of Environment, but we've now uh, broken off into separate ministries. We still work really closely with them. Uh, we provide training to all new officers, all seasonal officers. So they are all trained in watercraft inspection and provide an additional level of support to our program. Um, when it comes to regulatory offenses or anything, um, any non-compliance related to watercraft inspection, 
or AIS, um, it can be reported to the 24 hour turn in poacher and polluters line and the conservation officers support efforts um, related to anything um, non compliance for AIS. Um, actually, just yesterday, we had new highway patrol officers trained in aquatic invasive species um, awareness, um, understanding of the regulations, and starting this summer, they will also be providing support, um, enforcement support to our staff. Um, anybody that operates while um, watercraft inspection stations um, knows that there are challenges related to, you know, failing to stop and things like that. And the highway patrol officers in Saskatchewan will now um, have full authorities under the Fisheries Act and will be able to stop those vehicles, turn those vehicles around and send them back for thorough inspection and follow up. So that's really great to have an additional 35 to 40 officers that will be supporting our watercraft inspection efforts. And that training just took place yesterday. So that was really exciting for us. Um, and then we also uh, do quite a few planned and targeted organized um, check stops in Saskatchewan in conjunction with uh, the, the conservation officers. And these are targeted on, you know, certain water bodies where we know we have a lot of watercraft movement. Um, they might be close to the border in key areas such as Highway 10, close to Lake of the Prairies, um, where we, we work and do targeted enforcement and outreach every year with the conservation officers. So a little bit more about our watercraft inspection program and kind of where it sits. So of course we are within the fisheries unit. Uh, we sit within the fish, wildlife and lands branch within the ministry of environment. And um, this, we started actually within the compliance uh, branch of the ministry. And in 2018, um, our program was moved over to fish and wildlife branch. So um, a bit of information or history, I guess, in 2015 was when the first group of um, people and officers went down to Minnesota for some training and it was really watercraft inspection and decontamination training. Those regulations were put into place to allow us to inspect and designate staff to inspect watercraft and complete decontaminations within our regulations and the act. And then in 2016 we had our first I guess what we would call watercraft inspection um, program staff. We had only two watercraft inspectors with two decon units. Um, and really early on, the conversations began with uh, the Canada Border Service Agency recognizing that we needed to do something to protect our southern border. We are a very popular tourist destination for angling, particularly on northern Saskatchewan. There's a, quite a few folks that come from the, United, from the US. Um, and come up to Saskatchewan to fish. And we knew we had watercraft coming from high risk areas. And so we started those conversations with uh, CBSA to figure out a way that we could monitor and, um, and intercept those, those vehicles for inspection. Um, and that has developed into a really great partnership where we are notified of watercraft coming through the US border. So in 2017, we expanded, or sorry, we operated the same as 2016 with just the two term and trailers. And then in 2018, we had the movement of the program into the fisheries unit and fish, wildlife and lands branch. Uh, my position was created. And I should mention, we also had an additional person that was working on monitoring at the time. So Ron Blasney was with our unit and kind of trying to do AIS off of the side of his desk for quite some time. And it wasn't until 2018 where we kind of had a, a dead, another dedicated full-time person for aquatic invasive species. So we expanded to the four inspectors and three stations. And as I mentioned, we, uh, we moved, moved branches and started to have some students that were dedicated uh, to support Ron in monitoring efforts for zebra quagga mussels and spiny water flea. Um, fast forward to 2019, we expanded to seven inspectors, still with only three stations, um, primarily along the southern border to intercept that traffic coming from the US. And we still had students dedicated for monitoring. In 2020, which was, of course, the year that COVID hit, um, we opened stations along the Manitoba border. Those, when I talk about that risk-based model, we knew that Highway 1 and Highway 16 were very high-risk routes of travel. Highway 3 is along the Manitoba border as well, but um, quite a bit slower than the other two. And one thing to note for Highway 1 and 16 is that it's a very common route for all of our commercially hauled watercraft and the large vessels sailboats, houseboats, things like that, that are typically sitting in marinas and moored for long periods of time, which make them very high risk for being contaminated with AIS. Um, we did close our southern border stations during COVID. We knew we were still gonna, going to get notifications, but the limited travel through the border allowed us to reduce um, staff um, during that time. 
In 2021, we were so fortunate to have Paige join us. Paige was um, hired in 2021 and we expanded to nine inspectors with uh, five stations. So we had our three Southern stations and our two Manitoba border stations. In 2022, we were up to 11 inspectors, which is the most we've ever had, and we operated those five stations again, three along the southern border and two along our Manitoba border. So what goes into one, one watercraft inspection program season? So much. Um, hiring, which is, of course, you know, we don't have dedicated HR staff that, that do our hiring. That is, that is something we have to take on, and it's, it's a, a fairly lengthy process. Um, training, of course, there's quite a steep learning curve. We try to, um, to target students that are in environment or resource law um, enforcement programs to bring on as watercraft inspection staff. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. And so, um, you know, there can be a bit of a, a learning curve. And so we do uh, extensive training with our staff to make sure that they're comfortable and they have to, you know, learn everything from, you know, the inspection and the decontamination piece, understanding how our decon decontamination trailers work, um, dealing with the public, dealing with difficult um, people in the public. So our staff get tactical communication, which will help, which just helps um, helps them deal with confrontation and people who are maybe not as, as friendly as, as they should be. Um, as I mentioned, we also provide training to all of our conservation officers. So that's an annual cycle. The highway patrol staff will be trained on an annual basis as well for any of the new recruits coming into the service. And then we also do training with Canada border service agents, um, when they have new staff come on board as well. So our training piece takes up a significant amount of time as well. Um, the scheduling, of course, we're operating different stations, which all have different needs and are operated a little bit different depending on the type of station, the location, um, and the risk levels. So all of our schedules are a little bit different, um, which takes some time to sort of sort out. Uh, thousands of inspections, as I mentioned, we have inspections being done by our staff, by conservation officers, by seasonal conservation officers. So trying to make sure that we've got everything um, working as it should is, is important. The education and outreach piece, of course, we're doing this with every interaction with the public, but we also do a lot of targeted outreach and education. So we, we do a lot of that. Dealing with our, with our muscle fouled boats, of course, equipment breakdown. Anybody that is operating those Landa decontamination units know that knows that this is a, a common um, a common woe. Um, so dealing with our equipment as well. Special events. We often get asked to do one off things. Um, for example, in the provincial parks, if they're doing a kind of a, a special event, we'll bring our staff out and have kind of a a, a a presentation or booth set up to, to do some outreach at those events, rapid response planning. So making sure that we um, are able to practice, we're keeping all of our resources up to date, our contacts up to date through our provincial task force, making sure we know who needs to be contacted in the event of a response. Um, and then partnerships. So, uh, you know, our work with the Invasive Species Centre here has been a really great partnership and we've able, been able to do a lot of different things um, with this group. And really because of the size of our program and that we're so small, we rely a lot on partnerships. And partnerships are, are fantastic, but they also take a lot of work to coordinate, you know, to make sure that they're, they're working for both partners and accomplishing the goals that we've we've set out to to achieve. So, um, yeah. So it's a lot of moving parts uh, for just a couple of people. <laughs> so our, our annual program timeline, and again, this can vary a little bit depending on the season. But typically, we're starting to well, we post our positions early in the new year and start to uh, focus on hiring and interviews. Um, we're often competing with the conservation officer service and some of the other programs. So. Um, that's, we try to do that as early on as possible. Policy review, budget forecasting, um, you know, to see where we're at for the upcoming season. Late winter or late fiscal, um, we're still carrying on with those hiring and interviews, you know, making sure we have enough supplies for the watercraft inspection program for our monitoring efforts. Um, a lot of our monitoring now is done through partners. So it's, it's coordinating to see what they need, what we need to get out to them and have ready to go once they get out into the field servicing equipment, making sure that all of our, our decontamination units are serviced and ready to go. Um, our staff come on board early May, um, right at the beginning. So we're right into training and getting them into the field as soon as possible. Basically, as soon as ice comes off, we know we have watercraft moving 
surely we have it moving all year, but that's when uh, that's when things get really busy. We jump right into AI, AIS field work, um, typically in, in the spring as well. And that's when our monitoring program and monitoring efforts starts. So that of course carries on through May, June, July, and August. Um, we have had to do, uh, we've had years where we've had multiple training cycles as well. So that can carry on all the way through into June, depending on staffing. Into the fall, September and October, we do have a couple of um, term uh, employees that we've been able to keep into October for the last couple of years. Again, thanks to the partnership with the Invasive Species Centre. Um, and so we still have staff operating through the fall. We're still trying to wrap up field work typically um, in the fall as well, working on trying to compile our year end stats program reports. Um, and then through November and December, we're working on things like risk assessments, um, which has been really great with having Paige come on board and having some additional capacity to be able to do that for things like Prussian carp and, you know, flowering rush, developing management plans, review of protocols for next year. And of course, this all kind of cycles through. And we're working on those partnerships year round through through this whole process, um, which, which touch on various aspects of the program from prevention all the way through to management and control. So what is a watercraft inspection? Well, essentially it's, it's an inspection to make sure that uh, the watercraft is clean, drain, dry, that it's free of AIS, it's not fouled with any of the species of concern, that we're not transporting water, um, and it's going to apply to all types of watercraft, as Paige already mentioned. And this includes motorboats, canoes, kayaks, sailboats, paddle boards. It also includes all water-related equipment. So we're taking a look at anchors, ropes, tubes, angling gear, life jackets, essentially anything that has been in um, and touch the water or that can carry water is something that our staff will inspect and assess uh, risk for and decontaminate if needed. Um, one of the ways that we assess the risk of a watercraft is through the, the history information, recent history information of that watercraft. So where was it last used? How long ago was it used in any of these infected species jurisdictions? And our our list was developed in 2015 or implemented in 2015 and really was focused on um, zebra mussel and quagga mussel um, infected jurisdictions. So there are um, jurisdictions that are not on this list, but certainly do have aquatic invasive species. And we, we do consider that when, when dealing with watercraft, but this is also um, something that will be updated when we do uh, the review of the regulations. But essentially we take a look at the history of the watercraft, determine if it's recently been used in any of these jurisdictions. And if so, we then take a look at the watercraft to see if it's you know got any water in it, transporting any water, or if there are any other red flags, um, such as you, know, you see plants attached or there's mud covering the, the boat, which can of course harbor seeds and et cetera. So um, the first piece is, is to determine where the watercraft has been, the next piece is to see if there's any of those red flags, and then we make a decision on inspection and decontamination from there. So this is a really um, kind of broad overview of how we assess that risk. As I mentioned, we figure out where it was last used, if it was in a high risk or a, a contaminated jurisdiction. How long it's been out of the water is really just a, a way to help us gauge um, and that decision-making process. If it's been more than 30 days, um, we wanna see if there's any standing water or visual AIS. And from there, we can assess the risk. So anything that's high risk um, obviously needs further follow-up, potentially decontamination. This is also something that uh, the Canada Border Service Agency uses to kind of triage boats for us as they come through the US border. So they'll follow this flow chart and anything that is determined to be high risk is sealed and then sent to our program for further follow-up. So as far as the inspection process, basically the, the traveler will come into the station. They should be stopping, of course, it is mandatory. Um, they're greeted by our staff, an inspector or a conservation officer, depending on, on the scenario. Um, our inspector will ask questions to the owner to determine the risk of the watercraft. And again, they'll, they'll use that flow chart and uh, to get the information that they need. If needed, they'll complete the full inspection of the watercraft and gear. And depending on what they find, um, they may complete a decontamination of the watercraft. And this is just to, to mitigate any, any potential risks, such as standing water that could be carrying villagers, et cetera. If AIS are found, if it's a fouled boat, uh, the boat will be decontaminated and it'll be quarantined if it stays here in Saskatchewan. We've implemented a mandatory 30-day quarantine. 
if the boat is traveling beyond Saskatchewan, we will still provide a quarantine order and we notify um, the end jurisdiction and any jurisdiction that they will be traveling through so that we can help track that watercraft and make sure that it, it gets to its destination and can be quarantined on the far end if needed. Um, we contact and involve our enforcement staff as well. So um, the decision related, you know, with respect to fines or warnings or seizures, um, that is left up to our compliance staff, but that is certainly options and tools that they have at their disposal um, to be able to find folks or, or seize uh, watercraft and equipment as well. And if the inspector is satisf satisfied with the result, um, they will then be continue, allowed to continue on their travel or to launch. So again, depending on what they find, um, they will mitigate the risk and uh, the boat will carry on. <clears throat> so what makes a watercraft inspection station? I will turn this over to Paige. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, so this is kind of a simplified, um, I guess, version of what makes a watercraft inspection station because as you've already heard that's it's a lot but um, a couple of the ingredients I guess first we need staff so our, our AIS watercraft inspectors we definitely need a decontamination unit to remove that risk if we're finding anything and we have lots and lots of signage to make sure people know what we are and that they need to stop and so last year this is the location of where our watercraft inspection stations were. So as we mentioned, we're targeting a lot of the borders near the, or highways near the Manitoba border and the Southern border, since that's where a lot of the main species of concern are. We also had a station in Regina and Swift Current to try and um, respond to a lot of that traffic coming from the States as well. And we also up here um, in Nipawin, we have a, um, decon unit that stays there permanently, um, not typically managed by any of our, our staff. Um, so it's not really a formal station, um, but this is a very popular area, Token Lake, uh, where, for anglers. So we have a, a decon unit there just in case. And just to show you a little bit of a zoomed in version. So Highway 1 and Highway 16 along the Manitoba border and the rest of our stations here as well. And so first, like I said, our staff, so our staff positions are called Aquatic Invades of Species Watercraft Inspectors, and they are all designated as fishery officers under the Fisheries Act to enforce regulations. And like Jerry mentioned, we do rely a lot on the conservation officers and the highway patrol staff um, to actually do a lot of the enforcement. Um, so our staff don't typically you know, hand out fines or, or do anything like that, but um, they are designated as officers, so they have the ability to visually and physically inspect boats and equipment. Uh, most of the staff are hired as student positions, and a couple we've been able to have as term, and like Jerry mentioned, many of them are studying to become conservation officers, which is quite relevant for that. Their role. So first and foremost, evaluating the risk of watercrafts entering the province using things like that flow trait chart that we showed and asking the questions. Um, of course, physically doing the inspections and performing any decontaminations if necessary. They're applying all rules and regulations that pertain to AIS and making sure that every contact they have with the public um, leads to some form of education to either teach them about the risks or some of the best management practices that they can adopt in their everyday life. Training, we mentioned that training takes a lot of our time. So this is um, kind of what's involved in our whole week of training that we do at the beginning of the year with our staff. So we give them um, a pretty detailed look at um, some of the species and pathways of spread, obviously focusing on the movement of watercraft. We teach them how to use the flow chart and what types of questions that they'll be asking to try and evaluate risk. We give them a couple of different scenarios um, where we'll you know, give them an example of the boat's coming from here, it's headed there, you found this, what do you do? Um, we physically, of course, teach them how to do the inspections, how to perform a decontamination, how to use the units. Uh, we also uh, partner up with the conservation officers and have one of them deliver a tactical communication training course, um, you know, how to speak professionally and how to 
um, talk and react in those difficult situations or if you're dealing with a difficult person. And of course, we give them lots of practice with the equipment that we have, uh, the decontamination units, or just working with trailers in general. Um, speaking of our decontamination units, here it is here. This is the Landa Eco 7000. So it is um, our, the main unit that we have, the only unit that we use. And so it has these water tanks here <clears throat> in the yellow, and it's essentially just a great big pressure washer, but we also have the ability to have heated water with it. Um, the, the decon units have reclaim systems. So when we're using water, we're able to set up mats and vacuum pumps to try and recycle and filter that water to be used again, which is really handy because a lot of our stations are in rural Saskatchewan, so we don't have easy access to water. And of course, as you can see, they're mobile, so we are able to transport these guys wherever we want. Um, we try not to move them around too much. They are very, very heavy, especially when they have water in them. So bouncing around on the Saskatchewan roads can cause a lot of wear and tear, um, but we do have the ability to move them around all of our units. And our decontamination protocol follows the UMPS protocol. And so this is a procedure that um, I, I believe all of the Western provinces and most of the states follow this protocol. And essentially it just provides science um, to give guidelines about water temperatures, um, time under contact that's needed, different um, chemical options that can be used to effectively decontaminate different types of aquatic invasive species. And I will note that our staff, we only ever use hot pressure water. And most of the time, uh, our staff are actually using low pressure water as well but we do have the option to use uh, high pressure water for say needing a boat comes up just covered in invasive mussels that need to be removed. So we only use regular tap water, heated tap water, no chemicals or anything. And so types of inspection stations, we kind of break it down into two different types. So we have our fixed stations, which are uh, highway roadside inspection stations, and then a couple of different types of roving stations. So fixed stations, um, semi-permanent, I would say. They, we don't typically move them around a whole lot in the summer. Um, they'll, they will be located right on the side of a highway. And so an example of that would be our Highway 1 and Highway 16 station along the Manitoba border there. We have a bunch of different kinds of signage trying to notify people that if they're carrying a boat, they need to be stopping. So we have the sign that you see here in the picture, as well as some of the big sign boards. Um, of course, we have a decontamination unit and usually a couple of different staff at these stations. Our roving stations. So one component of the roving stations are to be located at um, local boat launches. And they will set up here, like you can kind of see in the picture, at um, the top of the boat launch and everyone who's coming to enter that lake will come and talk to our inspector and have an inspection done. Um, most of the time these are low risk boats. So just meaning that they haven't left Saskatchewan or you know, they haven't really been anywhere. If they have, they've likely already come through an inspection somewhere else uh, in our province. And um, so they're typically aimed more so at education. And I love this picture because you can see one of our staff here is getting the watercraft owner in this picture to you know, physically remove the drain plug himself. So it's teaching those good behaviors and there's a lot of great education that comes from our presence at local boat launches. The other component to our roving stations are or maybe the top priority are to respond to any boats that are coming across the international border. And like Jerry mentioned, we do have a really good partnership with Canada Border Services Agency. So they will notify us of any watercrafts entering from that border. And then those staff who work at the roving station can respond. And so the Canada Border Services Agency, they will do a low level evaluation of the risk of that boat and collect different types of information from the owners as well. And if they have determined based on the criteria we give them that that boat needs follow-up, 
they will apply a quarantine seal. Um, it's basically just a, a great big zip tie, but it fixes the boat to the trailer. And then they are notified that they must be inspected before they can launch in Saskatchewan. So then they send us the notification and then we can contact the boater and it's those staff who work at the roving stations that will try and meet them along their way. And so just to show you um, again, which of our stations were fixed and roving, um, the stations along the Manitoba border, like I said, are more of our fixed stations, as well as Estevan, although this station does receive quite a bit of traffic from the international border just because of where it's located. And then our roving stations here in Red, Regina and Swift Current are, you know, um, their job is mainly to respond to any traffic kind of coming from um, different entities. Uh, this other southern portions of the border where they're not coming through Esteban. And then if there's no traffic coming through, they will go to one of those local boat launches. And I'll pass it back over to Jerry. Sorry about that. So as I mentioned, we do partner closely with our compliance staff to conduct roadside inspections along highways and at parks throughout the province. And primarily, as I said, we're trying to do these on the, the busier highways, some of our double highways um, heading into northern Saskatchewan, for example, on Highway 2 north of Prince Albert, um, the big double lane highway between um, Saskatoon and Regina. And again, these are kind of twofold. Partly it's the, um, the enforcement piece and the regulatory piece to make sure folks are following the regulations, such as removing their drain plugs, um, but also outreach and really trying to get that message out there about clean drain dry and the regs that apply when you're using and moving watercraft. Um, yeah, we'll move to the next slide. Perfect. So this is an example um, of our compliance rates for um, the drain plug uh, regulation, the requirement to move that for transporting. So we're, we're slowly getting better. We're up to 63% compliance for this piece. This was a regulation that was implemented in 2018. Um, and it's kind of been a slow one to, uh, to see increase in compliance, but we are getting there. And again, it's just a really important tool when it comes to early detection um, and rapid response. If we're wanting to uh, minimize any, any additional spread, if we do have an introduction and really be able to have success with containment or any potential eradication. Uh, but still, yeah, still no for 11% there. So we have, we have some work to do yet. Uh, the commercial hauler piece. So when with those high risk routes of travel on Highway 1 and 16, we do see a lot of movement of commercially hauled watercraft. And this includes um, two types, basically dealer transport, which is the, the new watercraft. They're often shrink wrapped. Um, so these are brand new boats going from a manufacturer, usually in the U.S. or further east to a dealership. And sometimes these boats are headed for dealerships in Saskatchewan. Sometimes they're headed to dealerships in other Western provinces, such as Alberta or British Columbia. And then we have the private commercially hauled watercraft, um, which are usually used boats being sold and transported. Um, and they're large, so they're, they're being transported by commercial, uh, commercial haulers. And these would include things like, you know, large sailboats that will be moving from the Great Lakes or Ontario all the way to, uh, to the coast or to British Columbia. So for our dealer transports um, and these new, new boats, generally they have less risk, but there are watercraft um, that do that are brand new that get tested in, um, in public water bodies. And there is potential for there to be um, AIS contamination, which means that there would be some risk for those boats. So while used um, privately sold boats are generally higher risk, um, they're less common. So those, those boats that are the, the used boats that are sailboats and things, um, they are definitely higher risk, but we don't see as many. We see more of the new boats um, moving, but it is definitely a combination. And we've worked with Alberta and BC on an exemption program for our commercial haulers and um, the movement of commercial commercially hauled or dealer transport watercraft, especially the new ones, created, created some uh, challenges for our programs. You know, having 10 boats that are shrink wrapped show up on a, a semi trailer is is very daunting for watercraft inspectors in the field and it, it's not necessarily safe if staff have to get up on the back of these units and you know oftentimes they can't actually effectively inspect these watercraft and so what was happening is that 
Um, we were having to coordinate at the destination, at the, the tail end with the dealership uh, to have those boats inspected before they could be released. And, you know, dealers were in a hurry. Oftentimes these boats are sold before they even arrive at the dealership. So they were in a panic to get them out the door. Um, so it just created some challenges. So this exemption program has really helped make things more efficient, both for haulers and for dealers, but also for our staff as well. And essentially what it means is that uh, manufacturers for watercraft can apply for an exemption and they have to um, provide a bunch of information on how the watercraft are tested, how they, uh, you know, any processes that might be followed to help mitigate risk of, uh, of contamination from AIS. And they apply to uh, to our program and we've developed a scoring criteria and if the manufacturers meet a specific threshold um, that we would consider acceptable that there's there's little or no risk. Um, those manufacturers would receive an exemption and they would receive documentation from the three provinces. So now if a manufacturer is exempt and a semi hauler is carrying boats from that manufacturer, he has documentation that can be presented to watercraft inspectors to say, you know, here we go. I'm hauling Lund boats, which are exempt. They are shrink wrapped, but they're exempt. So that means the watercraft inspectors know there is no risk and they are they can release that watercraft without requiring further follow up, um, which has been really great. And the commercial haulers, it just speeds up the process. Um, it, it doesn't negate the fact that they still have to stop at all watercraft inspection stations. It just means that when they stop, things move much quicker. And dealers um, and drivers seem to be quite happy with the program so far. This was the first year that we had full implement implementation of the program. Um, but drivers are putting pressure onto manufacturers to apply uh, because it does make things a lot easier for them once they're once they're moving those watercraft. And we also um, have an audit program that goes with that um, that exemption to make sure that you know we're going to do spot audits to make sure that manufacturers are actually going through the process and following those protocols um, to mitigate risk that they said they would when they applied for the exemption. So uh, there's kind of a follow up piece there. When it comes to interprovincial coordination, we've touched a little bit on this already, but there is a lot of communication that happens between um, provinces when it comes to watercraft inspection, particularly with the movement of anything that's high risk or fouled. So if anything is, is intercepted that is AIS fouled, um, it will be um, it will be dealt with by the jurisdiction that has intercepted it, but then when it continues on on its journey, it is then the staff there will contact any jurisdiction that will be affected that the, the watercraft may be traveling through to make sure that they're aware of the movement of that high risk or fouled watercraft. So there's a lot of communication um, that takes place between the watercraft inspection staff from all of the provinces within Western Canada. We do all have very similar inspection station setups. Um, so we understand, you know, we all use the UMPS protocol, so we understand what, if a, if a watercraft is decontaminated, we know what that means. Um, and again, watercraft are still required to stop um, at all inspection stations they encounter along their travels, and they are still subject to inspection and further decontamination if the next jurisdiction feels it's appropriate. Um, but we do coordinate and, and keep each other in the loop throughout the entire process. Makes us all feel a lot better. <laughs> So here's just an example of the, some of the numbers of AIS fouled watercraft that we've inspected at our stations or intercepted at our stations. And a huge number of these, I would say over 90% or 90% ish have all been intercepted on highway one. So again, it's a very, very high risk route of travel. We have those high risk watercraft that are sitting in the water for long periods of time that are at risk for contamination. So just an example of some of the numbers we've intercepted over the years. And just some examples of some of the, the things we have found. And it's a really huge job for our inspectors. They're so small, they're very easy to miss, um, which is again why you know it's it's required at, at multiple stations and those double up of inspections is really helpful. Um, inspection staff have a huge responsibility and a huge job um, because really they are they are the defense about um, to prevent the spread into, like I said, Saskatchewan and, and further into Western Canada. When it comes to education and outreach, we do we try several different things to reach several different types of audiences. We participate in a provincial AIS awareness week, which is in May, and we usually do targeted posts and, and share information throughout that week. 
Um, we do monthly social media posts, whether it be species um, profiles or targeting and identifying or highlighting, sorry, a certain regulation, such as that requirement to remove the drain plug. Um, so lots of social media. We typically do two news releases per summer, sometimes more, depending on uh, if we find something that we feel is, is noteworthy. Um, we've done quite a few radio interviews. We participate in special events, as I mentioned. Some, most often it's at the provincial parks, but there are other events that take place, whether it be through the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation or some of the events put on by our partners, our provincial task force partners, where we will have staff participate and do outreach at those events. Multiple presentations throughout the year. Um, as I mentioned, we have a provincial task force, which has representation from essentially any group or agency that um, may be impacted or, or affected by an introduction of AIS. And one of the main um, responsibilities of that group is out, outreach and education and to make sure that we're getting accurate um, information out to the public. So they're really helpful in that regard. And then, of course, um, our website. And we're undergoing a, uh, a revamp of our website and we'll be getting quite a bit more information up there. It's been some time since, since it's been refreshed. So um, yeah, just trying to share as much information as possible as we can through our website as well. So um, some of the other partnerships or initiatives that we've been working on just this past year, we released the invasive species framework. And this is just a province wide approach to man managing invasive species. And what it is, it's just an overarching framework to ensure that all of the programs related to invasive species management um, are aligned and have uh, kind of, you know, have implemented incident command, for example, as a um, a tool for incident response. So this is, you know, forest pests, this is um, terrestrial species such as wild boar, um, and then of course the aquatic, uh, the aquatic piece as well. And we partner with the Forest Services branch. This was actually something that we did prior to the uh, implementation of the, the province-wide framework, but it was kind of one of the things that um, you know, is a good example of how we can align and coordinate and collaborate um, through that framework. So um, our AIS inspectors actually receive training each year from the insect and pet pest expert from our forest services branch um, that is specific to forest pests and diseases. And of course, we're on the aquatic side. However, um, you know, because we are located on the Manitoba border, um, we are in a perfect position to be able to intercept anybody that is moving firewood from further east, which of course is, um, which is a risk for things like emerald ash borer, um, so it's a, it's a really great way that we can provide support to other programs um, and stop the, the movement of firewood and um, prevent potentially the spread of other invasive species. So our staff watch, they, they understand how to identify high risk firewood and essentially we can just make sure that it's removed um, no longer being transported and that it's disposed of properly. So um, as I mentioned, lots of partnerships, there's a lot of moving parts, um, but we've really been able to uh, to leverage those partnerships to be as effective as we, we possibly can. So I think that's all we have and we'll, uh, we'll open it up or throw it over to Colin for questions. All right, uh, thank you, Jerry and Paige. Uh, I think there was a lot of information that you've packed in here and we do have some follow-up questions just to get some clarity on some of those points. Um, so one of these questions I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if you would have an answer necessarily to uh, which provinces does the uh, CBSA do inspections for? Sure, I can take that one. Um, it's so they're not necessarily doing inspections. They're sort of triaging, as I mentioned, just getting information about the history of the boat. Um, there are occasions where they will do a more detailed inspection and take a look to see if there is standing water or if the plug is removed. But it really varies from uh, port of entry to port of entry, depending on how busy they are. So um, currently, I know Alberta and BC do get some notifications from CBSA. Again, it really depends on the location and how busy those ports of entry are. Um, and DFO has done a recent pilot at the port of Emerson as well um, to try to, to intercept and get information on the movement of watercraft. And our hope is that it will be something that can be implemented nationally across, across Canada at the international border. Yeah, I'm sure that would be welcome. A lot of these questions that are coming in, they're 
from uh, individuals from other jurisdictions. And so there's a lot of interest in what information we can take from this webinar today and translate it for their own work out there. So uh, I'll just post the audience as well. Um, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, just pop those in the chat and we'll try to get around to them too. Okay, um, so there was another question in here uh, from an individual who works for a not-for-profit who's operating a boat decontamination station, but they haven't developed formal staff training protocols yet. I think we touched on some of the different types of materials um, that supported that training process, but could we just kind of summarize it for them again? Sure, so tools to develop for, for training um, folks that could do watercraft inspection training, sure. So I guess the first thing would be to check uh, with the jurisdiction that you are in, just to see if there are additional regulations. So just as, as an example, Manitoba has additional regulations uh, to require decontamination. I think Jerry might have froze on us. Um, we'll see if we can get her back in a minute here, and perhaps um, I'll move on to some questions that Paige maybe can help me address here as well. Uh, would you have Canadians, any? Is there protocols? Sorry, uh, go ahead. Jerry. Uh, it seems like um, there was a hiccup there with the connection, oh. so I'm sorry, we'll have to ask you to start from the top again, if that's all right. Sure. So I was just going to say that the first thing I would recommend is to check um, with the, the folks that, that are mandated to manage AIS within the jurisdiction where you are located, just to make sure that, you know, if you are going to provide a service that um, there's kind of coordination and partnership happening with uh, the province or the state um, or their jurisdiction that you are in to make sure that you're not, um, you know, doing things completely different and independent of each other. Um, some jurisdictions do have additional requirements um, and regulatory requirements when it comes to decontamination. So you'd first have to make sure to see if that would even be possible um, to provide that service. Um, you would probably wanna make sure that you're providing the same and similar service. So find out what uh, protocols the, the jurisdiction that you're in are using. As I mentioned, UMPS, uh, the UMPS protocol is a very popular one and um, used through a lot of the jurisdictions within Canada and the US. Um, yeah, I, I think just as my, I can't emphasize enough that you would just want to try to coordinate with uh, with the folks that are working in that jurisdiction, just to make sure that you're complementary and not not working against each other. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's probably going to make for a more effective program overall. I would expect. Okay, so I do have a few follow up questions related to uh, costs. Actually, for some individuals, I think trying to scope out. Uh, what parts of this program they could take to adapt for their own. So for the Landa unit, will we have a rough idea about how much those cost? I can't imagine they're they're inexpensive. They're not inexpensive. Um, the last uh, Landa units that we purchased ran about forty-two thousand um, dollars, and then of course there are potentially additional accessories that need to go with that, and, and there is quite a bit of maintenance that is uh, needed to to do um, just to maintain the units in good operation. Um, there are options to have those units um, quite a bit cheaper if you don't need a mobile station. So if you can have a fixed station and you have the ability to have proper containment um, and you know water access and things like that to make sure that any, any of the water that's coming off the watercraft and the unit is not going into a storm drain or into a water body. As long as you have good containment, you have the option of doing a, a fixed station or, or fixed model, and they're quite a bit cheaper, closer to 15,000 or so. But the mobile units are, are quite a bit more expensive and run upwards of 40,000 plus. Okay, thank you. Um, and then relative to those Lando units, um, there's a question in here about the PSI and water temperature. I wouldn't necessarily expect you to provide the specifics on that in the spur of the moment, but I believe those are in accordance with recommendations from the literature. Is that right? Yes, correct. So I can't remember the PSI off the top of my head, but um, typically we're wanting to get up to 140 degrees um, Fahrenheit for, uh, for effective, um, I guess, to, to kill zebra quagga mussels. So the tricky thing with decontaminating watercraft is that um, it's very challenging to find one method that is 100% effective for all species. 
other than clean, drain, dry. Um, but really, because the UMPS protocols are very focused on zebra quagga mussel uh, decontamination, it is, it's, it's 140, but it depends on time on contact. So you have under those protocols, you have the option to drop the temperature down to 110, for example, but you have to increase your time on contact. But all of those uh, requirements and protocols are, are defined under that, that UMPS protocol. Okay, excellent. Um, and then there is a question in here about how boat owners are supposed to know about the regulations and where that information is available. I think we touched on some of those um, educational resources. Could you point people towards perhaps some of the digital resources as well as maybe where there's signage and outreach specifically in Saskatchewan? Paige, do you want to take that one or do you want me to take that? Yeah, sure, I can. Um, I, the first thing that I thought of when like asking how boat owners are supposed to know the regulations, um, it's something that goes in our angler guide every year. Um, so there are a list of just kind of like general prohibitions and regulations in the angler guide. And there's definitely some about aquatic invasive species. Um, our regulations are all publicly available as well. If someone wanted to take the time to go through the fisheries regulations, um, the angling website for the government of Saskatchewan lists a lot of our aquatic invasive species regulations right now as well but since we are doing a really big update to our website we're hoping to have um, a section on our website that's very specific to our regulations as well um, so yeah there's lots of places where they're publicly available um, we try and have signage as well at some of the boat launches about more so about um, clean, drain, dry, and, and just best management practices. But all of our signage for our stations all say mandatory as well. So that's another way that we're trying to increase awareness about some of those regulations. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'll also just add, as far as I understand as well, that you do work with um, local organizations as well, and they conduct some of their own uh, outreach about that. Um, I don't know if they also produce signage, but they're a part of, I think, the education process too, right? Yeah, for sure. Like uh, like Jerry said, all of our partnerships within our task force kind of have that expectation to do a lot of outreach. And so some of them will actually set up um, demonstrations at some of the boat launches and be educating folks about clean drain dry and the requirement to move the drain plug, um, that kind of stuff as well. So that happens kind of depends on which watershed group it is, but those demonstrations are are ongoing all summer long as well. And of course, from our conservation officers and seasonal conservation officers at the parks as well too. Uh, there was one last question here, which I don't know if you'll be able to address, but someone just curious about what is the scope of the budget for the overall program, just getting a rough idea about, I guess, startup costs as well as ongoing costs. Sure. I, without being able to be too specific, I would just say that um, our operating budget is less than or around 500,000 uh, if we're factoring in external sources of funding and, and some of the partnerships and in-kind support would be kind of a rough idea. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that covers all of the questions for today. Um, I do want to just thank uh, Jerry and Paige again for your time and patience. Uh, uh, developing this presentation and then delivering it. Um, this uh, webinar is recorded and will be up on the Invasive Species Center's uh, YouTube channel, as well as our website, www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Um, just a reminder as well, uh, after the webinar is closed, there will be a brief survey. It will only take a couple minutes of your time, and we would gladly appreciate your feedback. I want to point to the next upcoming event that the Invasive Species Center is hosting, and that is the 2023 Invasive Species Forum. Um, we hope that you'll join us on February 7th to uh, 9th. Registration is still open now, and it's completely free. You can find registration under our events page on the Invasive Species website. And this year's forum is uh, focused on invasive species action in a changing climate, so relative to that intersection with climate change, another hot button issue right now. The forum uh, presents the opportunities to learn from a variety of uh, dedicated uh, sessions, including also ecosystems resilience, uh, vectors, pathways, and threats, indigenous communities, and many more. And with that, thank you again for attending, and we hope to see you at the forum. <laughs>